And now we are ready for the third pick. And the Chicago Bulls, who have been drafting very high down through the years, and they have the third pick today. The Chicago Bulls pick Michael Jordan of the University of North Carolina. The 1984 draft was the greatest NBA draft ever. He had Michael Jordan and Hakeem Olajuwon, eight rings, two goat horns. He had Charles Barkley and John Stockton, two top 30 all-time Hall of Famers and rings culture poster boys. He had quality all-stars like Kevin Willis, Otis Thorpe, and Alvin Robertson. Wait, wait, don't fight Shaq, Alvin. Oh, punch this, bro. You had Michael Cage and his stupendous Jerry Curls. You had Terrence Stansberry, the guy who gave us the immortal Statue of Liberty dunk. And you even had the NBA's best what if of all time. And it wasn't just what if Portland had taken MJ over Sam Bowie. It's the entire 1984 draft. I mean, that thing was like a what if apocalypse. Hakeem will be your pick? Yes, no question. And Samson will move to forward? I'd, I'd be up to Bill Fay. Once Houston won the Tankapalooza 84 coin flip over Chicago and locked into Akeem Olajuwon, he didn't have the H back then, all hell broke loose. First, there was enough trade chatter that 1984 Woj would have been dropping Woj bombs like Duval and Apocalypse now. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Picking second and third, Portland and Chicago were both rumored to swap their picks for Houston's Ralph Sampson, and Portland actually made an offer. You know Sampson for this shot that killed the 86 Lakers. Sampson! It goes! It goes! It's over! And you know him by the time he beat up a short white guy in the 86 Finals. And now, Seasting and Sampson! And now, Dennis Johnson! And you know him for his incredibly weird Puma posters. Because if you're not the Predator, you're the prey, right? But in the summer of 84, other than Magic and Bird, the seven foot four Samson was the NBA's single best trade asset. In fact, we learned from Hakeem's 1996 autobiography, Living the Dream, which definitely did not go on to win the Pulitzer, that Houston nearly traded Samson for Clyde Drexler and Portland's number two pick. Quote, the Rockets could have had a lineup with me, Clyde Drexler and Michael Jordan, but the Rockets never made that move. Now that's a staggering what if. MJ playing with a super duper star center? Drexler becoming MJ's Pippin? It's like imagining a Microsoft Apple merger in 1981. Or Hulk Hogan being in a Rocky movie. Oh wait, that actually happened. I'm coming after you, battle boy. Meanwhile, everyone, and I mean everyone, was trying to steal that Jordan pick from Chicago. Dallas offered all-star Mark Aguirre straight up for the pick. Philly offered an aging Dr. J straight up for the pick. They also offered Andrew Tony plus the number five pick. Yeah, the pick that became Charles Barkley, that one. Seattle offered Jack Sigma and their pick. I mean, it's hard to believe Chicago turned down this Sigma perm, but they did. Golden State offered Joe Barry Carroll, but since his nickname was Joe Barely Cares, Chicago wisely said no. Eventually, the Bulls started feeling that they were sitting on a winning lottery ticket, and guess what? They were. So is that enough what ifs for you? It wasn't, because I have some more. Please note that any player with remaining intercollegiate basketball eligibility cannot be selected in this draft unless he was among those players who renounced his intercollegiate eligibility prior to 45 days ago. Did you know Patrick Ewing nearly entered the 84 draft before changing his mind and returning to Georgetown? Had that happened, Houston definitely takes Ewing first, Hakeem goes second to Portland, and Chicago gets MJ anyway. Plus, we enter the Marty McFly zone and we have to reconceive every NBA outcome from 1985 to 1998. Every finals from 88 to 98 is probably different. Portland would have been an immediate powerhouse with Hakeem. No Ewing in New York. That means no frozen envelope. And you know what? MJ would have had a harder time winning six titles. Maybe he never gets suspended for gambling. Oops, I mean, maybe he never would have retired to play baseball. Speaking of MJ, in 1984, his superstar potential was hazy only because he played for Dean Smith in the pre-shot clock era. They were on the four corners back then. Everyone knew MJ was good, but how good? Perhaps you can turn that Bulls thing around. What do you think? Hopefully uh, I can go in and contribute and maybe turn it around. A 6'5 junior from Wilmington, North Carolina, number nine, Michael Jordan. His crazy ceiling didn't leak out until the 84 Olympic tryouts, 
which Jordan dominated to the point that USA basketball coach Bobby Knight called Portland's GM, his buddy Stu Inman, and implored him to take Michael Jordan. I think he's the best athlete I've ever seen play basketball, bar none. When Inman said that Portland actually needed a center, Knight screamed at him, we'll play him at center then. And remember, that summer, Nike also signed Jordan and built an entire sneaker line around him before he ever played an NBA game. So for anyone claiming that we didn't know how good Jordan would be in the summer of 84, it's just not true. 14-year-old Billy Simmons, he was more excited for rookie MJ than any college player since Bird and Magic. Yeah, that was my room. And if you think Portland desperately needed a center that year, guess what? That's also a lie. They won 48 games the year before with a perfectly decent center combo, Michael Thompson and Wayne Cooper. Look at those stats, not terrible. They also had legitimate young trade assets like Drexler, Jim Paxson, Fat Lever, Calvin Natt, Cooper. What they really needed was a physical all-star forward to battle the Birds and Barclays and Sampsons. For instance, that summer, San Diego shopped Terry Cummings and finally dealt in Milwaukee for Marcus Johnson after the draft. Well, why didn't Portland overwhelm the Clippers with a Cummings offer? They could have taken Jordan second. I'll never understand it. Instead, they sent Lever, Cooper, Nat, and their 85 first round pick to Denver for Kiki Vandeweghe, a terrific scoring forward who doubled as the worst defensive player alive. Trust me, Larry Bird used to pour barbecue sauce on him, slice him into little meat cubes, and eat Kiki whole. Bird steals it. You can see it coming, and look at the pass. Here's how lopsided that deal was. Denver jumped from 38 wins to 52 wins in the 85 Western Finals, solely because of that trade. So if this was a sliding doors thing for Portland, think of it this way. Door number one had Jordan, the most exciting college guard of the decade at the very least, plus, 23-year-old Fat Lever, who made a second-team All-NBA just two years later, plus Calvin Nadd, who averaged 23 a game for the 85 Nuggets, plus Wayne Cooper, who was a solid center, plus a 1985 number one pick. What was behind door number two? Kiki Vandeweghe, who couldn't guard anybody, and Sam Bowie. That's it. You only picked door number two if you thought Bowie was a sure thing, and if you didn't think MJ would come back to haunt you. Hammer home how dumb and indefensible and reckless that strategy would have been in 1984. Let's go back to the actual telecast of the 1984 draft. Our announcers, Al Albert and Lou Carnesecca for the USA Network. Here we go. Today, live from the Felt Forum in New York City, the USA Network presents the 1984 NBA College Draft. Wait, wait, wait. What's wrong with Lou? Did they just not care who was on TV in 1984? I think that was true. Fortunately, they cared about the phenomenal 80s porn music. Speaking of porn, look at that porn stash on the commish. He looks like a cross between Ron Jeremy and Gabe Kaplan. Oh, wait, and look at the mullet on that Houston guy. Oh, man, you got to love the 80s. And the Rockets' uh, timing has been impeccable. Last year, number one with Ralph Sampson coming out. This year, Akeem Olajuwon decided to come out early, and that's uh, just in time for Houston. The postman did ring twice. The postman did ring twice. Someone get Lou a laugh track, for God's sakes. The Houston Rockets who are represented here by owner Charlie Thomas and his daughter Tracy, select Akeem Olajuwon of the University of Houston. It is official. The well Okay, so Hakeem goes first. And you know what's crazy? Houston just passed up the greatest basketball player ever. And I still kind of feel like they made the right pick. Hakeem did win two titles. He was one of the best 15 players ever. More importantly, check out that outfit. Low-cut jerry curls, a black tuxedo, and a maroon bow tie. So who went second in the 1984 NBA draft? Please, please, take MJ. Just do it, Portland. Take him. Please, God. Portland selects Sam Bowie, University of Kentucky. Check out the reps at Portland's table with dueling. Yikes. I hope we didn't fuck that up, faces. Sam Bowie, the young man who came back from a stress fracture injury, the left shin bone. He was out for two seasons, redshirted, and he has come back. He has returned strong with Kentucky. And he's now so a team that just lost Bill Walton six years earlier with repeated stress fractures in his feet. Just took another center 
who missed two full college seasons because of stress fractures in his legs. And he's older than the sure thing superstar about to get picked right after him? Sounds encouraging. An outstanding high post passer. He passed up the Olympics. Remember? So every major college player tried out for the 1984 Olympic team except Sam Bowie. Seemed like a red flag to you? Nah. Bowie's college stats were worse than Michael Thompson's NBA stats and slightly better than Wayne Cooper's stats. What an upgrade! Any thoughts, Lou and Al? And Lou, what do you say for a young player who sat out two formative years and has come back to regain it? Hmm, don't pick him? I think it shows the type of perseverance he has, that he was able to withstand all that misery and come back and perform and look where he's now. I mean, nothing gets fans more fired up than words like perseverance and withstanding all that misery. Screw that Jordan guy and his stupid dunking. Sam, uh, Courage has been your middle name. You've had to really fight back from some adversity, and I know a lot of folks, particularly yourself, are happy to see this day arrive. Right, I had a two-year layoff with my uh, leg injury, but if I wouldn't have had the support from the community of uh, Lexington as well as the state of Kentucky, I don't think I'd have been able to do it without their help. Imagine being a Blazers fan and watching this. Mad props to Sam for defying the odds and coming back, but man... Why take a defying the odds guy with a sure thing still on the board? Why even risk it? Why? Answer me! They tell me that they put you through an extensive physical before they made a decision on you. And the end result was a good one. Well, I went up to Portland and they gave me about a seven hour physical. They didn't let anything out. So uh, I don't know if that's referring back to the Bill Walton situation. I know he had a stretch fracture, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm 100% sound. Ooh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. A seven-hour physical? This is like watching the Hindenburg take off. Check out the ecstatic look on the guy who's on the phone for Chicago. It looks like he's getting blown under the table. Chicago Bulls, uh, the team that's uh, ready to go next, and uh, Michael Jordan seems to be the next one up. Everybody's excited about that one. He really captures the imagination. Yeah, then again, you could say the same about a seven-hour physical. Well, there was a question a little earlier, perhaps. Uh, Portland toying with the idea of the great can't-miss talent of Michael Jordan against uh, Sam Bowie, who, uh, who, of course, coming off the injury, he says he is sound. Portland has checked him out through a seven-hour extensive test. But the question is, Bowie going now over the course of a, an 82-game schedule. It is a calculated risk. A calculated risk? Has every Blazers fan thrown up in their mouth a little at this point? Oh God, here it comes. Now we are ready for the third pick and the Chicago Bulls who have been drafting very high down through the years and they have the third pick today. The Chicago Bulls pick Michael Jordan of the University of North Carolina. Hear the crowd applauding and cheering? Yeah, they knew even back then. This man is a can't miss, whether a guard spot or the forward. It's 6'6", 195 pounds. You know, he makes them when they count. He can do it in traffic. He can do it under tremendous control. He's a great, great creator. In the, in the mold of a Dr. J, not as big, but is in that class, and I think he's going to make a great, great ball. He's what you call the people's player. People love to see I mean... How can any team roll the dice with red flags like calculated risk, seven-hour physical, two years layoff, adversity, courage, perseverance? How can they do that and pass up white flags like can't miss talent, great, great player, star material, sure thing, in the mold of a Dr. J, great, great creator, people's player? Incomprehensible. Totally, completely incomprehensible. Which brings me to a special bonus what if. One hour before the draft, what if Portland's decision makers reconsidered everything one last time? It's like the second to last scene in All the President's Men, when Woodward and Bernstein wake up Washington Post editor Ben Bradley in the middle of the night, urging him to run their controversial report about corruption spreading all the way through Nixon's White House. The boys haven't slept in two days. Bradley's wearing a bathrobe. He looks pissed off since they woke him up. They just screwed up the same story a few days before. Finally, Bradley does let them write the story, but not before telling them. You guys are probably pretty tired, right? Well, you should be. Go on home. Get a nice hot bath. Rest up 15 minutes. Then get your asses back in gear. We're under a lot of pressure, you know, and you put us there. Nothing's writing on this except the uh, First Amendment, the Constitution, freedom of the press, and maybe the future of the country. 
Not that any of that matters. But if you guys fuck up again, I'm going to get mad. If Ben Bradley owned the Portland Trailblazers in 1984, he would have put the fear of God in everyone deciding that pick. Unfortunately for Portland fans, they had an owner named Larry Weinberg, a real estate tycoon, who definitely was not Ben Bradley. They took Sam Bowie, the rest was history. But hey, nothing was riding on it except for the future of the NBA, hundreds of millions of dollars in lost revenue, somewhere between four and 10 squandered championship titles, and a lost opportunity to employ the greatest basketball player of all time.